attention to Titus chapter 2. Brother Phil, can I get a little bit more monitor up here? Titus chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And 11 through 13. There's some good people that go to church here, you know it. We got an email. Uh, I'm not sure if it was last night. And uh, there was there was a lady who was a member of a different church that was out in the rain. And they were trying to haul something. Their vehicle broke down. And more times than not, when, when that kind of thing happens, everybody just drives by. But there was a gentleman from this church you might know about. It. It's called... Um, the Bible Church, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> a gentleman from the Bible Church that saw this family in need and pulled his truck up and hooked up his strap and said, hey, wherever you want to go, I'll take you. And he handed him a church card and told him what his name was, and, and uh, they have a church home someplace, but they were just so excited that somebody had enough of God in them to stop and help them a little bit. And Brother John Brooks, thank you. For loving your church and loving God and trying to witness to somebody yesterday, that was a tremendous blessing. <clears throat> Amen. I enjoy hearing stories like that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, 11 through 13. The Bible says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine." That the aged men, or just a little bit older men, if that makes you feel better, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The little bit older women, likewise, that they may be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teaching, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Maybe I shouldn't have read that part. Should have put that in different translation, ladies. I'm, I'm sorry. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking. I don't know about you, but I'm looking. Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Could you just lift up your hands and love them together with me? Oh, I love you, Jesus, and I, I worship you here today, Lord, for the power of your word and of your goodness, and I pray over this congregation right here today, Jesus, that your hand would be upon the lives of everyone. God, as we preach this message today, that's not just to the, the, the moms, but it's to everybody in the church, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, right now of the power, oh God, of how we ought to live because there's coming a day, there's coming a day when you're splitting, you're splitting the sky wide open. Oh God, you're getting ready to come and I'm getting ready to go. I don't know how everybody else feels in this place, but Jesus, I want, I want a heart that's ready. I want to be ready to go. I want to do the will of God. I want to be obedient to you, Jesus, that your name might be lifted up in this wicked evil time oh that there might be a righteous people that there might be a godly people that love you 
Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your promises. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I want to say we welcome all of our guests that are here today. Some of you are visiting family from out of town. I know we have several of our congregation that are visiting family somewhere else. But we're so glad that everyone is here today in the house of the Lord. Amen. I want to talk to you for a little while today about the ripple effect. The ripple effect. I, I uh, <clears throat> saw on Facebook just the other day, my, my brother and I decided to send something to our mom for Mother's Day, and I don't know what he got her, but um, he, he ended up getting this at least cool card. He's very witty, more witty than I am. Maybe that's not saying too much. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but he's, he's pretty witty, and um, he has this way of communicating with mom that I can't. You guys remember the Smothers Brothers? The one would always say, well, mom likes you best. Remember that? Well, me and my brother never had that kind of... Uh, uh, of battle between each other, but what was really unique was he could say things to her that I couldn't say. You see, he communicated love in a way that didn't look like love. Think about that. So he would say, Mom, you're ugly. And that meant he loved her. He'd say, Mom, you're old. You're wrinkly. And that meant, Mom, I care about you. I'm the younger brother, so, Brother Craig, I tried it. <clears throat> brother McManus, I looked at her one day and said, Mom, you're ugly. And she bawled, and she squalled, and she cried, and she wept. You meant it. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it. I just was following my brother. Well, that's the way he expresses love. Okay. I never did that again. So my role is I'm the soft-hearted son, try to be, and he is still the one that cracks the jokes and can get away with it. So he, he, um, he writes this card to my mom, and it says, Don't worry, Mom. My therapist says it's not all your fault. Dad helped mess me up, too. <clears throat> yeah, happy Mother's Day, Mom. And I thought about that, and over the past couple of days, I've kind of chuckled about it. And then I stopped, Sister Claudia, I stopped and I thought about it. And I said, you know what, the only reason why that's funny is because it's not true. The only reason it was funny was because I knew he was kidding and she knew. That was just the way that they talk about things. But how many people have grown up struggling in a great way and even needed therapy because of the example of the person that was lived in front of them. Wow. That's a big deal. The Apostle Paul was pretty consistent in his writing about mentoring and about discipleship and about being an example for other people to follow in the truth. He was very consistent in that. You see, he wrote... To Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and 12, he said, Let no man despise your youth, but be thou what? An example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. Again, he said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 2, And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, Paul said, Timothy, I'm going to teach you, and I want you to teach somebody so that they can turn around and teach somebody else. It is the power of a godly witness that is like a ripple effect that goes throughout an entire body of believers. It can go through a city. It can go through a church. It can go through a nation of people if there are folks that are willing to make up their mind, I'm going to live for God, and then I'm going to invest in somebody else who's going to one day invest in somebody else who's going to invest in somebody else. That is a recipe for revival. Truth has got to be passed on. 
but it's got to be passed on in a powerful way, in a biblical way. Truth has got to be lived. It cannot just be spoken, but it's got to be spoken and it's got to be lived by the people that say, I am an example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth has got to be lived in front of the next generations. You see, the Bible talks about in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 1, Paul tells Titus to speak things which become sound doctrine. Well, speak them to who? What he's talking about here is basically saying, tell the believers. Tell all the believers to live a life that matches sound doctrine. When you study and you look at, you look at Titus chapter 1, you find that Paul left, he left Titus in the, in the land of Crete. He left them there to set some things in order. See, the Bible tells us that there were a lot of unruly people in Crete. The Bible tells us that there were a lot of deceivers, and, and, and it tells us in Titus chapter 1 that one of their own prophets said, the Cretans are always liars. They're always evil beasts, and they're always slow bellies. Now, I don't know why you need to read a whole lot of other books. They're not near as entertaining as the Word of God. There are all kind of great stories in the Old Testament, New Testament. There are all kind of great phrases, right, Brother Bracken? You've been reading a lot this past couple of months. There's something powerful about it. What do you mean slow bellies? What a great phrase. These people are always slow bellies. Well, another word for that is they're lazy gluttons. One man translated it like this. It's basically talking about a man who was, as it were, all stomach. That's pretty rough. Sometimes we want to say we like food because we're apostolics, but we don't want to get that far. We want to like food. Some of you might be foodies. Any foodies out there? Yeah, there's some. You know what I'm talking about. But there, we're talking about a place that we still don't want to go. These people, according to the Scripture, profess that they knew the Lord. They profess they knew God, but in works and an example and in how they lived, they denied the Lord and they were abominable and they were disobedient. And to every good work, the Bible says that they were reprobates. These Judaizers not only taught false doctrine, but they lived ungodly and unholy lives. The fact of the matter today is that how people live make all the difference in the world. How we live makes all the difference in the world. I don't know if there's somebody here today that would say, Pastor, I plan on living right until the very end of time. I plan on living right until Jesus comes. I plan on doing the right things until the Lord calls my name. One person said it like this, every person is a mentor in some way. Everybody's an example in some way. Either we show people how they should live by how we live, or we show them how they shouldn't live by how we live. Huh. Everybody is discipling somebody. Everybody's being an example somehow. Everybody is making a difference and an impact in somebody's life somehow, some way. May it be that we are not people that say, do as I say and not as I do, because that doesn't work in any generation. But let there be a people of God that say, I'm going to say the right things, and I'm going to do the right things. I'm going to say what's right, and I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to say what's right, and I'm going to live what's right. See, the fact of the matter is this principle and practice go hand in hand. Principle and practice, they go hand in hand. You see, it's easy for us to say as parents to our kids, don't do that. You better not do that. You better not do that. Well, if we say that it's wrong in principle, then in practice, we better not be doing it. Anybody agree with that? Principle and practice need to go hand in hand. And that's why Paul challenges Titus to tell the believers to live a life that matches sound doctrine or that matches the word. If there was ever a time, this is what Paul was telling Titus way back then. Paul was telling Titus way back then, if there was ever a time to rise up and to live a life that matches God's word, it's right now. That's what Paul was telling Titus. If there was ever a time to be true examples of godliness, it was right now. If the younger generations ever needed somebody to be true to God and live the right way, it was needed right now. If it was that way back then, how much more? 
How much more right now should the church of the living God stand up and rise to the occasion? I'm going to live what's right. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to be a righteous man and woman of God. Why? Why all of this? Because there's a ripple effect. There's a ripple effect. People like to think how they live doesn't matter to other people, but yes, it does. You can encourage somebody to do right by you living right. You can encourage somebody to do wrong by you living wrong. <laughs> I pray to God that somehow before the Lord comes back that we are able as a body of Christ to say with pure unity, I want to please the Lord more than I want anything else. I want to live for the Lord more than I want anything else. I want to be right with the Lord more than anything else. So he told them, tell the saints. Tell the saints, tell the believers. Not only that, but he goes a little further, and then he says, tell the older men. You know them little bit older guys. Uh -uh. We're not trying to hurt nobody's feelings about age, not the ancient people, just a little bit older. Tell the guys, a little bit older. Tell them something. Tell them to be men of good character. Tell them to use good judgment. Tell them to be well-grounded in faith and in love and endurance. Why? Because it has a ripple effect. It has a ripple effect. You look at the Vaughn family back with the elder who's rejoicing in heaven. But you see the ripple effect that goes throughout the rest of the family. That there were people and it's also the sister that continues on pressing on in righteousness. There's something about a foundation. There's something about a mom and a pop that say, you know what? We're going to stand for what's right. We're going to stand for what's true. We're going to stand for what's good. And there's a ripple effect. There's a ripple effect. And it's, it's bound to determine to bring about a great move of God in any church. When people say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to live a life of holiness, of righteousness, of godliness in front of everybody I see. Not just when I walk inside of the church, but everywhere that I go. When I go inside the grocery store, I'm not a different person. I'm not somebody different altogether. But I'm still an apostolic person filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let it ripple out in the world. Let it ripple out into society by God's people that say, I'm going to make Make a difference by how I live. Ripple effect. Why are you telling these guys, these older men, to be examples? Why? Because the younger men need an example. They need an example of what good character is. They need an example of what good judgment is. They need an example of what being grounded in the faith is. They need an example of what love is. They need an example of what endurance is. He's talking to the older men. To the younger men. And he said, there was a man that said it like this one time. He said, setting a good example for your children takes all the fun out of middle age. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Setting a good example for your children takes all the fun out of middle age? No, it doesn't. You know what's fun is watching your kids grow up and make good decisions. You know what's fun is watching your kids grow up and have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know what's fun is watching your oldest daughter marry a guy that knows how to make apple crisp. That's fun. Solid working guy, hard working guy, loves the Lord and can bake. That's father-in-law security right there. Uh-huh. Huh. I read in an article this past week, and it said that in many homes today, younger people are weary of the lack of leadership example by their parents. And so the younger are now trying to lead the older. I thank God for people, for young people. That, that are doing the very best they can to stand up and live for God and be leaders and love righteousness and love truth, even in the absence sometimes of role models. But, but there's still something that is important to me, and that is that how many other people in that situation are becoming spiritually bankrupt because the example of the people they're following are spiritually bankrupt people. 
I think there ought to be something inside of every saint of God that says, not only am I going to live for God, but there's going to be something inside of me that is an example for somebody else to follow. I don't want to go to heaven just by myself, but I want somebody to go to heaven with me. I'm not just going to hold on to this thing, but I'm going to let somebody know how to be a man of good character. I'm going to let them know how to use sound judgment. I'm going to let them know how to be well grounded in the faith and love and endurance. You're not meant to go to heaven by yourself. Mm -mm. The ripple effect. The ripple effect. There's a pastor that told me some time ago that he met a man who, who worked with a gentleman from his church. And he said this. He said, I understand that Rodney goes to your church. Yeah, that's right. Rodney goes to my church. The guy looked at him and he said, well, he's pretty worthless, isn't he? That's encouraging. What do you mean he's pretty worthless? And you look at something like that, and sometimes you say, all right, well, it's time to pile on Rodney because Rodney's worthless. But my question is, who has been in Rodney's life up to that point? My question is, was there ever a man of God that was older or younger or something that, that knew understood the ways of God, a man of good character that was in his life to show him how to be the man that God wanted him to be? Was he just the guy that came to church every Sunday and then said, okay, the rest of your life, bye. You're all by yourself. I hope you learn the doctrine. Come back Sunday. Come back Wednesday. Try to learn everything you can all alone, all by yourself. Why have we been talking about all this discipleship stuff lately? Why? Because it's impossible for brand new people to know everything about God from just a Sunday service. It's more than just Sunday, and it's more than Wednesday. they got to know how to live for God every single day. And in this day and age, it's not going to be by accident. There's all kind of stuff out there to, to distract people from living for the Lord and serving God. But I want you to know something. There is a power when people join up and say, let there be a ripple effect. One that loves another, that loves another, that loves another, that loves another. Whether it's guys together, ladies together, let them love the truth of the Lord together. Let them grow in the power of God together. Let them grow in the anointing of the Lord together. Why? The ripple effect of revival. Can't do this thing alone. Can't do this thing by yourself. You got to have, you was talking about it today, somebody praying with you, somebody caring about you, somebody loving you, somebody teaming up. You know what? I, sometimes we get this whole thing backwards. Sometimes we get it all wrong. Just come and show up to church and hopefully, Brother McManus, they get the Holy Ghost or baptized on a Sunday. I, just, I hope they show up the next Sunday. Come to the new convert class. By the time Sunday comes along, their faith is gone. They've been too beat up. We're talking about the power of connection on a daily basis. We're talking about a ripple effect of somebody that's been in God for a long time that finds somebody else that maybe hasn't been in God very long and says, let me, let me, let me get together with you. Let's love the Lord together. Let's grow together. This is still one of the most powerful experiences, Brother Craig, I have ever had in my life. You and me learning this because one day you're going to disciple somebody and I'm going to disciple somebody else. We're going to see God do a marvelous work in the power of discipleship power of discipleship you think about it because so many times it's just about us it's just about one person i'm going to worship the lord i'm going to come i'm going to mind my own business you know the spirit of the world sometimes does creep into the church it really does just just me i'm not going to worry about you i'm not going to worry about you nobody else just me i'm going to take care of me and that's it but that's not bible the Bible says that we got to take care of ourselves, but then it also says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The ripple effect inside of a church. The ripple effect where you're able to call somebody on the phone and say, today I'm praying for you, and tomorrow I'm going to pray for you, and the next day I'm going to pray for you, and the next day I'm going to pray for you. Why? Because I want to see God move in your life, and I want to see God do something powerful. Saints of God, it is time that we try to get a different dynamic inside of us. Let's just not do everything on Sunday. Let's not do everything on Wednesday, but let's love somebody on a Monday. Let's love somebody on a Tuesday. Let's talk to somebody on a Thursday. Let's minister to somebody on a Friday. Let's bless somebody on a Saturday, and then come to the house of God and rejoice. Huh. There was that older man in Rodney's life. 
to give him godly counsel and instill godliness in him. Where was the older man to show him the way? He was just left alone flopping. Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It's a powerful chapter. I'm glad that, that the Ethiopian eunuch was there. I'm glad that Philip came along and ended up baptizing him. But where did it start? It started with the Ethiopian eunuch. And this man, he was a, in the hierarchy under the queen of Ethiopia. He was a eunuch in very high rank. And the Bible said something interesting happened. That there he was sitting down and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. He was trying to figure out what in the world does this thing mean? How do I understand this? Man, I wish somebody could show me. Huh. So the spirit of the Lord begins to talk to Philip. Philip hastens over to where this guy is. And he said, sir, do you understand what you're reading? And the, the eunuch looked at him and he says, well, how can I except some man shows me? You see, there are so many people that are looking for somebody just to show them something. They're looking for, here it is, a hierarchy man. He was in a high rank with the queen of Ethiopia. This is like the story of Sister Vani Marshall. I don't know if you've heard this. Here's a lady as a powerful woman of faith. And she used to be in a Buddhist, Buddhist family. And she was a part of, of what, what do you call this? In that Buddhist family, the Buddhist priesthood. All right? She talks about how hard her life was. You, you just don't leave that area. You, you don't leave that. But you know what? She was so hungry for God in her life that she just tried everything she possibly could do to eventually find the Lord. And one day she was able to come to know who Jesus was, was baptized in his name and filled with the Holy Ghost. But this is the beautiful thing. We talked about Brother Stone King going and ministering at the U.N. breakfast. Sister Bonnie Marshall preceded him and, that, and gave her testimony of how she came out of the Buddhist priesthood to be able to be an apostolic filled with the Holy Ghost person, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when she shared her testimony with the UN breakfast people, she said, how many of you would like the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How many people were there? Like 61 people. How many hands were raised? 61. She told them, you need the Holy Ghost to lead your country. You need the Holy Ghost to lead your country. You need the power of God to lead your country. Who here wants the Holy Ghost? And they all raised their hand. There were eight people that came up in that prayer breakfast that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> that in and of itself is powerful. But what my question is, is what about the ripple effect? What about some heads of state that are going home into places that they may not let missionaries come through? We don't need missionaries to go there if heads of state will pray through and receive the Holy Ghost and go and tell people, you got to have this Holy Ghost. you got to have this Holy Ghost. you got to have it. The ripple effect. Get into heads of state. Who's going to get with other people? Who's going to get with other people? Who's going to get with other people? It's the biblical plan. It started the ripple effect with somebody that was willing to say, listen, I'm not going to just do this by myself, but I'm going to reach out. See, the point is, is it's not just about the saints and it's not just the, the, the men, but it is also about the women. The Bible tells us that the older woman was supposed to live a life that becomes holiness. You boil down the word of God and it's this. In the New Testament, praying men and modest women. Praying men and holy women. Do men need to be holy? Absolutely they do. But there's something special. Ladies, you know the power of holiness. You know the power that's in your life because of living that holy, dedicated life unto the Lord. Clark said in his commentary that women should example their holy calling and how they dress and their manner of walking and their general behavior. That they shouldn't be like the world, but they should be like the church, adorned with decency and holiness inside and out. Why? Because the younger need an example of the older. The younger need to be able to say there are those holy women of God that stand in faithfulness every single day. That no matter how up or down they go, they come to the house of God. Their sister Vaughn still holy and godly. Their sister Leah still holy and godly. Their sister Minnick still holy and godly. There are the women that are of faith that say... I'm not going to back up from my right walking with God. Teaching the younger women to be sober. What a word. 
teaching the younger women to be sober. That's kind of interesting because the Bible's in one translation says that the older ladies are supposed to teach the younger ladies how to be sane. How to be sane. Yeah. And some of the young men are figuring it out now. That's why I don't understand women. They're just insane most of the time. That ain't what he's talking about. What he's talking about is in the Greek and the Roman culture. It was kind of something unique among the ladies that they love getting tipsy. They love getting drunk. They love walking around just drinking themselves silly. And so because it was in the Greek and the Roman society, this was an important teaching in the church. He was teaching them against drunkenness because when a person is intoxicated, they lose their senses. They're not sane anymore. They're not controlled by their mind. You see, so he was trying to teach these people that, listen, older ladies, you got to do this right because you can't teach the younger people to not do something that you're doing. In other words, your lifestyle and the way that you live is as important or more important as what you say. Like the lady who frequently drank strong liquor in front of her kids. All the while that she was drinking, she was telling these younger kids not to do it because it was wrong. She was telling them this stuff is bad for you. It's a bad habit. It's going to hurt you. It's going to mess your life up. Besides, you're too young. Is there really any surprise that while she was trying to teach this to her kids with a, with a thing of liquor in her hand, drinking it, is there any wonder why the kids, when mom was gone, figured out a way to find out where the stash was and help themselves? Is there any wonder? You want to know why? Because it's the same thing. Do as I say, not as I do still doesn't work. That's why it becomes everybody, male and female, young and old, as, as lives that are godly, holy, and righteous, and biblical. I don't know if there's anybody here today that would just stand for a minute and say, you know what, by the faith of God, I'm going to live my life soberly, righteously, in the word of God, in the will of God, by the power of God, live in a righteous life for the Lord. It's not just what I say, but it's also what I do. It's not just what comes out my mouth, but it's also the life that I live. Come on, somebody give your body today a living sacrifice. Give it a praise unto the Lord right now. Give him a praise. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I give you, I give you, I give you, I give you my life today, Jesus. I give you my life. Just keep standing for a moment as I close. Perhaps the woman said it right who said, if you mess up raising your kids, whatever else you do doesn't matter. All the other accolades don't matter, all of the other accomplishments don't matter what's he talking about if the life is not lived in front of the people who we love the most that's why i like what one lady taught to her kids she taught them jump at the sun jump at the sun this i don't know where she was from jump at the sun s-u-n and sister mcmahon she taught her kids that because she wanted them to reach for things to jump as high as they could for the sun, Brother McMahon, to reach as high as they could in life. And this is what she told them. You're going to jump at the sun, and you're never, you're never going to reach the sun, but at least you're leaving the ground. At least you're leaving the ground. You're going somewhere. And I got thinking about that because in our lives, we need to jump at the sun, S-O-N. We need to be reaching toward the Lord. We need to have a life that's continually every single day reaching out to the Lord, pleasing Him, loving Him, worshiping Him, being like Him, jumping, reaching out to the Lord. Because you know what the Bible tells us at the end of this chapter we studied? That at one moment there will be a time when you jump one last time at that sun and your feet will not hit the ground anymore. That is something we're looking for. That's why we got to be examples because we got to go to heaven together in this thing. Somebody's got to be reaching out to the Son of God right now, reaching out to the Lord Jesus Christ. I reach to you, Lord. I reach to you with my life today. Looking, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that glorious appearing. 
of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That with that in mind, we reach to other people. With that in, uh, in mind, we live a holy and a righteous life. With that in mind, we pass it along to somebody that together, 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 we can make heaven our home. Folks, the New Testament church was built on a regular, everyday relationship with Jesus. And so many of the things that we talked about throughout these past couple of months had their foundation in this fact that you cannot get everything you need in your walk with God on a Sunday. You can't. Because Monday through Saturday, you're going to leak. And you're going to need to be filled. But Monday's coming, and you can be filled on Monday with the Word of God, with faith, with the power of His Spirit. Tuesday's coming, and the enemy's going to be waiting, but you can be filled with the Word. You can be filled with His Spirit. You can be filled with direction. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be grounded, I want to make sure that I'm going to help somebody else be grounded. Are you grounded today? Then you need to find somebody in your life that you can help ground in the ways of truth. Do you feel you're not grounded? Then guess what? You need to find somebody. You say, I need, to, I need to team up with you. I need to make sure that I am doing what I need to do. You need to find somebody in the house of God that you might both be grounded, but you just want to go through a journey together that says, let's grow in God. Let's study the word of the Lord. Let's be accountable to God's word each and every single day. Why? Because it's the ripple effect. It's the ripple effect of God's power. It's the ripple effect of His Word, and it helps people belong to the kingdom of God and to minister to somebody else. Folks, we can't be selfish with this thing. We can't be selfish with the truth. We can't be selfish with what's right. We can't be selfish with the power of the Holy Ghost and with the greatness of the Word. We've got to be able to share with somebody the great things of the Lord Jesus. God, I pray today... I pray today for this congregation, Lord, that your blood and your word and your spirit today would be flowing inside of the life of every person. God, we're trusting in you right now. We're trusting in you right now that we could walk in the spirit of God. We're seeking your face, Lord, that we as people could deny all ungodliness. We could deny worldly lust and we could live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world so that it will be a ripple effect to other people who need the Lord, so that it would be a ripple effect to somebody who wants to get closer to God. Lord, don't let us be alone in this journey. Don't let us be by ourselves, but let us be dedicated to the things of the Lord. A ripple effect, a ripple effect, a ripple effect. A ripple effect. I just want to invite you today to close this service with me. As many as are willing to come and just stand at the front and say, Lord, somehow, some way, I want to be like you. I want to walk in your spirit. I want to trust in you. I want to believe in you. I want to be everything that you've called me to be. But not only that, but I want to be able to somehow, Lord, let the gospel shine through me to somebody else. I want to be a mentor. I want to minister to somebody. I want to let your work be a work in me that it would flow, that there would be a ripple effect in the power of the Holy Ghost, in the power of the Holy Ghost. We're going to sing, why don't you just come and stand at the front today, and while we sing that you lift up your